then the first derivative of our area function equals x squared. That's a basic substitution. It says if our function is x squared, and we know that a function is equal to the first derivative of its area function. You follow me on that? Then we say, all right, well, if fx is x squared, then x squared equals that. That's, that's our jump there. Can you make the jump? OK. So basically, we're asking this question. Can you find a function whose derivative is x squared? That's the question you ask. Can you find a function? And you know what we're going to call it? A of x, because that's going to be our area. Can you find a function A of x whose derivative is x squared? Let's try a couple. Let's just, let's just have some fun and try a couple, right? We know how to take derivatives pretty easily. Let's try one. Let's try, uh, well, if we use some common sense or some critical thinking, I should say, would you agree that you need a power bigger than 2? Yeah. Probably because when you take a derivative, that power decreases by 1, right? So let's try x cubed. Does it work? No, no because this is going to give you a prime of x equals 3x squared, right? That's not going to work. Okay, so we need to get rid of the 3 somehow. So if I can somehow undo the, un divide by 3, then maybe. X cubed over 3. Oh, let's try that. Let's try x cubed over 3. Would that work? Mm -hmm. Let's try. If I take the derivative of that thing, what I would do is I, I'd bring down the 3, right? The 3 and the over 3 are going to be gone. I'm going to get x squared. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, this one, not so much. No. This one, yes, worked. How many of you feel okay with that so far? So you're undoing the derivative. You're going backwards. So is it related to a derivative? Absolutely. But you're going the other way. And we had some, something unique, right? We had to have this over 3 somehow. Now let me ask you another question. It's going to blow your mind up like a mind grenade. <laughs> What's the derivative of that? Oh, what about the seven? Zero. There's another one that works. Rho this. Very cool, actually. What about that? Any constant. Any constant. No matter what it is, any constant is going to go away when you take a derivative, right? So what you actually get here is a family of curves. each of which would work as an area function. So here's what we've done. We've started with this function and we've said, okay, I know the function is actually a first derivative of an area function, whatever that happens to be. So I'm going to set my first derivative of the area function equal to it. I'm going to undo that, treating it like a derivative and undoing a derivative. That's why we call it the A, anti-derivative method. Okay, you're undoing anti, it's Opposite of derivative means derivative so mm -hmm. undoing opposite of you're undoing a derivative. That's what we're doing here. Now, unfortunately for us, this is a this is a situation, right? We have one, two, and we have an infinite number of possibilities for the area function that it could actually be. And in general, that's what you have to put. You have to put that some of your zone out. You have to put that plus c. The plus c is important. It represents a family of curves, each of which could be the area function. Now, I have also said some specific things about this. I said between 0 and 1, which is going to help us out a little bit, but if I didn't say that, this would be the general area functions of x squared. Of x, that's, that's what it would be. You'd have to have more specific, specific information in order to give me an actual verified area. Do you follow me on that? You have to have that. So, do you mind if I go over here? Do you have any questions about this one? 
Are you with me so far? That there's more than just one of them right now? Who the first for you, you actually asked before the reason. Say what? You actually asked before the reason. I know, right? <laughs> I was polite today. <laughs> So a of x equals one third or x cubed over three plus c. C is a constant. C is also the y-intercept of a of x. If something's the y-intercept of a function, you should be able to find it by plugging in zero. True? So what this means is that a of 0, if I plug in x equals 0, can you verify that that's going to give me just the c? 0 cubed over 3 is 0 plus c, so it's going to give me c. <coughs> now, I don't want to blow your mind up too much, but for this, for this context, do you understand that this, this area curve is from 0 to x, wherever x is in this case. That's what that stands for. So this interval that interval is 0 to x. This one might throw you for a loop, but I need you to stick with me, OK? If this is the area. <coughs> If this is the area from 0 to x, from 0 to x, you follow me on that? It's from 0 to x. And we are finding the area from 0 to, what did we plug in for x? 1. No, we didn't plug in 1. To, plug find, in the, to find this, what did you plug in? Zero. You plugged in 0. When you plugged in 0, what's the area from 0 to 0? What's the area? That's basically saying, what's the area of a single point? Can you find the area of a single point? A point is that which has no breadth. So that means you have no width there. So you can't find an area. It's zero times whatever the height is, but you still get zero. So I know this is, this is kind of awkward to think about the, the area of a single point, but that's what you're doing here. You're saying, all right, I'm going from zero to I plugged in x equals zero. That's how I got this. That's zero. So what this says is this is basically the area of a single point. When you set x equals 0, your interval is from 0 to 0. That's the area under a single point. The area under a single point is always 0. If you took any statistics at all, you know this, uh, with continuous distributions. Uh, you, if you ask what's the probability of an exact number, it's always zero. But you can't get it because there's an infinite number of possibilities. That's the same, same idea. The area is zero. So when you set x equals zero, the interval is zero to zero. That is the area under a single point. So what this says is, from here, here's what this says. It's two parts. Oh, yeah, sneeze. <clears throat> oh, it didn't come out. Oh, don't you hate that? Were you all ready for it and then nothing? Oh, I hate that. <laughs> and then your nose tickles. Like yeah, I hate it. Nose tickles. Oh, bummer. 
It actually looked like you sneezed for a second. I tried. <laughs> I kind of pretended, just so it looked good on camera. Yeah. <laughs> Valiant kidding. effort. Thanks. So here's what this this part says. This says if you're if you're going to plug in zero, your area goes from zero to zero. That's area under a single point. That is zero. This part says, well, I know when I plug in zero to my function, I get c. Therefore, if a of zero equals zero and a of zero equals c, how much does c equal? Yeah, zero. Yeah, that's right. What that says is, though, even though we had the c, we had to take care of the c. The c doesn't always have to be zero. It can, all, it can be numbers, too. we are talk about um, initial value problems later on, like, uh, later on in this section. You might have some c's that are numbers. In this one, you get a zero. So this, this is what you'd be able to do from this part. After you find your c, you go, OK. Then the area of that curve is x cubed over 3. Now you can start plugging numbers in. Now that you've dealt with the C. On the interval of 0 to 1, the area is, well, let's fill that in. Our area went from 0 to x. Can you tell me what is the x value of our interval there, where we're stopping? You can now plug that in. Now that you don't have that c, you know the c is 0, right? You, you'd be able to plug in the x of 1. You go, okay, well, then the area that stops at 1 is 1 cubed over 3. or one-third square units. Now that's our idea. Did you follow the idea? <coughs> I've given it to you in terms of geometry right now. I've showed you some interesting ideas with area to kind of flesh this thing out a little bit. Right now we're going to take a jump away from the actual area. I just wanted to introduce it to you. So it was a very long introduction. Do you understand the introduction? How many people do you feel okay with it? So rectangular method is you cut it into rectangles. We'll talk about that later. Antiderivative method is you go, okay, the first root of the area is my function. Let's undo a derivative. That gives us an antiderivative. We somehow have to, have to mess around with the C. We have to figure out what C's are. I'll show you better ways to do this as we go on, by the way. Okay. Better ways. <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> I need you to understand the idea. You can get the idea. I'll show you some shortcuts and, and work, ways to work around that. You, you follow? But you have to understand the idea. Now we're going to practice most of the rest of our time in this section on how to actually do the antiderivatives. This was fun. But I haven't showed you any techniques on how to do that yet. I've said basically you need to be able to undo it, and we kind of guessed and checked over here. Would you like some better ways to do this? Yes. Absolutely. So we're going to start talking about that. This is called the indefinite integral. Indefinite means that I'm not going to give you boundaries yet. I'm not going to give you 0 to 1 yet. That would be a definite integral. That would be the area between the points. That's what we were able to find, right? An actual number. What I'm going to leave you with is how to get down to here, that part. This would be indefinite. It's say you have a plus c, you don't know where you're stopping, you don't know where you're starting. It's just an indefinite integral because I haven't given you a range of numbers. Therefore, you can't find the definite area. We're just having the function of the area. Do you see the difference there? If you didn't catch what I said, rewind that and then repeat mm -hmm. that. Some of you gave me kind of like weird looks. Like you don't quite get that. I'm, I'm